Welcome to Lessons in Leadership. I'm Steve Autobot with my colleague, Mary Gemma. This is the first time Mary has worn that particular. I know I comment on you her. You comment attire all every the time. time on my clothes. It's new. <laughs> it's new. What, describe it for me. What is it? Well, I would say it's a lovely gray. It's got some white and black floral print on it. And believe it or not, there's like a little bit of a beige going on in some of the, in the flower petals. So, and, and you have a different shirt on. Would you like to describe your color? Listen, let's get this shirt. out of the way. I, I um, by the way, in the chat room, everyone's <laughs> saying that they like your shirt. So you ready for this? I got makeup on my other collar. This is not relevant, except I tried to wash it. And of course, now it has a stain. So I put this shirt on. And I said, you know, this collar is a little bit different. And Frank, can you see, Frank, Elvin, our director, doesn't like it. Scarlin hasn't expressed a point of view. And Frank, Frank Brown, our audio engineer, said, hey, that's the collar from the movie Goodfellas. <laughs> <laughs> right away. But I think Frank, I think it was a compliment. He said it was sharp and clean, but the tight is, is narrow. By the way, all-time worst interview I ever did. Speaking of Goodfellas, Joe Pesci. Oh, that worst was, ever. I Love him you, I as an even... actor. One word answers. Didn't give me anything, and I'm working hard. Yeah, he let you know that he didn't want to be there, Steve. <laughs> and then he said, "What am I like a clown? I make you laugh." No, I'm quoting the movie. I'm sorry, uh, no, I apologize. He didn't. Hey, Mary, do this before we bring on my good friend Mike Ryder. Uh, Mike Ryder, tell us who makes the show possible, which has nothing to do with Goodfellas. Nothing to do with my tie or collar. Go ahead, Mary. No, absolutely nothing to do with those things. And, and I do like it. I know you didn't ask my opinion, but I think it looks very nice. Thank uh, you. So, okay, so I'd like to thank the people that make uh, Lessons in Leadership possible. We have Gibbons uh, PC. We have Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, and the Bassino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, and the New Jersey Sharing Network. That's a mouthful. Yeah, it sure is. And by the way, we're great friends with the folks up at Seton Hall University, Go Pirates, and also the Bucino Leadership Institute. Uh, Brian Price will be with us. We're taping uh, him later today. And Dr. Nyer, the president there at Seton Hall, has been on with us, leadership uh, lessons in leadership as well. But, you know, the guy we have on right now, Mike Rueda, put, let's put Mike on camera. Mike is a fascinating guy. Mike is the um, director emeritus at the Gerald P. Bucino, 1963 Center for Leadership Development at the Stillman School of Business. Mike was the emeritus director. Mike, by the way, who's the uh, director now over at the Bucino it's Leadership it's, Institute? It's Ruchin Consal. And Mike, you have been teaching and you've been connected to Seton Hall University for more than a few years, right? Uh, from 2007. Mike's obsession in a healthy way is about leadership. Every Sunday morning, he sends out an email, an e-blast. It's called Three Minute Leadership. I do not start my Sunday without reading Mike's e-blast called Three Minute Leadership. It is powerful. It's succinct. It's inspiring. I shared it with Mary. Our entire re team reads it now. Uh, Mike, and we'll put up the information as to how to get Mike's uh, e-blast. Mike, what is it and why did you even start it? It started back when I was uh, in corporate with AT&T and Lucent Technologies. One of my uh, the joys of my life after finding my own journey, what I, I, uh, I was passionate and loved, uh, was I was an executive coach, mentored and coached some very, very senior executives. And part of that journey was, uh, and has always been, one is selfless giving. It's about people. That's that's me simply. It's about serving them to help them become more than they ever dreamed they could be. Mm. And one of the days back then, I said, "What more can I do?" Just like John Wooden, you know, in his very last speech said, "What UCLA, the greatest." Yeah. What could uh, I am sad that I couldn't have given you more, and that's part of me as it is with you and Mary you know, giving more. And I said, what more can I give back in 2007? And I said, a three minute leadership. It has to be three minutes, it can't be long. People don't have time. Get to the point and inspire me. And that's what happened since 2007. And so every week, people like me, Mary and others, who try to be better leaders, and by the way, let's make sure, Mike, can anyone uh, subscribe to it? How does it work? 
Absolutely. Uh, they can go to 3minuteleadership.com. That's exactly it, 3minuteleadership.com. It'll be up on the screen as you speak. Go ahead, Mike. And, and they can subscribe to it, and they will, every Sunday morning at 5 o'clock, they'll get a little note from me. It's awesome. He quotes people like John Maxwell, um, who was a great uh, leadership guru who I've learned a lot from, and so many others. And, and Mike quotes other people and then connects it back to some succinct, powerful leadership lesson. It's the essence of lessons in leadership, right, Mary? Yeah, absolutely. And it's so funny. Every Sunday morning, as Steve said, I wake up and I look forward to that. I always joke that it's my church on Sunday morning because uh, as, as too many of us, I don't go to church as much as I should. And that to me just starts my week off in a more positive way and just really helps me to connect with uh, who I am. So first and foremost, thank you for that. And you're also, though, a student and, and a coach and a mentor and have a passion for entrepreneurship. Can you talk a little bit about that and why it is so important, especially in today's day and age? Um, what is the connection between leadership, great communication, and uh, being a fantastic entrepreneur? It, it all, the threads just weave so closely together, you know, commun communication, entrepreneurship. Let me, let's do entrepreneurship first. Entrepreneurship is about seeing things that nobody else sees. To stretch yourself beyond your limit, understanding what's out there. You know, we always say that Steve Jobs imagined the unimaginable. To Steve Jobs, it wasn't unimaginable. It was Steve Jobs who was always pushing his boundaries, always pushing his limits and saying things differently. So when you have that spirit within you to find something new, to see something no one else sees, all of a sudden you get into that entrepreneurial mindset. Now, it's great to have that, but you need complementary tools and communication is, is one of the, the first and foremost to be able not only to have it in your mind, but to communicate it to people. You know, it's about, you know, Maya Angelou, those famous words, they may not remember what I said or what I did. Remember how they, they felt were, when they heard it. Absolutely, absolutely, it's about the feeling. So that's where that beautiful communication comes in. That's why in the three minute leadership, it is, I receive notes every Sunday back from the beautiful people I serve saying that was inspirational. You touched me, you made me feel something. That's what it's all about in life, to help people feel and then become. You know, you know Mary, for 20 years we've been together, we've been talking about uh, one of our books, 2006, Make the Connection. And the whole premise of that book is that you have to connect with people, not people on a human personal level. I actually traveled with Mike up to West Point a few years ago. Remember that trip, Mike? Absolutely. Um, I was asked by uh, some of our great friends at Seton Hall um, to teach up there, to do a seminar. And I'm talking to these young men and women at West Point, and I'm realizing I'm trying to talk to them about communication. And in many ways, these brave men and women are fearful of presenting and communicating. Mary and I talk about it all the time because they're trying to remember all these facts and figures and who's got PowerPoint, who's got index cards. But Mike's got it right, Mary, doesn't he? It's about how, and my, my Angelou said it right, they re, people remember how you made them feel, not exactly everything you said. They forget most of that. Exactly. I, I always tell my kids that all the time. I said, 100 years from now, when you look back, you want to make sure that you were not only, of course, you know, an expert in your field and did what you were passionate about, but you want to make sure that you were a good person and you want to make sure that you leave the world a better place than how it is when you came here. And whatever that impression is, whatever that mark, whatever that contribution is, we're all here for a reason. And it is all about giving to others and sharing of yourself and not not holding back and not being fearful of trying something new and embracing something that you really care deeply about. Hey, hey Mike, real quick, describe why the Bucino Leadership Institute and Brian Price leading it up there and, and Dr. Nyer and the team up there being so supportive and also Matt Barwick and, and Pat Lyons and others who are partners and friends up there, up there. Why is that institute, that Leadership Institute so important nationally? Because it becomes a, it becomes a beacon to others. Just as I, when I arrived back at Seton Hall back in 2007, here I come, still in corporate at that point in my life, you know, looking around this campus, my, my life is about leadership, my purpose and meaning, serving others. 
you know, I looked around campus in the business school, we had leadership. And then all of a sudden, after, after months, seeing little pockets, nothing in one place. And at that point in time, you know, it became my mission, my forget mission, it became my vision to have a place where all of leadership is housed within Seton Hall. Why sharing of best practices, sharing of people's ideas, creating that sense of family, okay? You do that in one place. You look at universities across the nation right now. They, they say they have leadership programs and God love them, they have, they have leadership programs, more academic bound, they have workshops, et cetera. They don't have that experience and culture of family. And that's what we built here from the simple work of the Bucino Center and you know, realizing my vision of taking it across Seton Hall and having the Institute founded thanks to, to Karen Boroff. You know, this becomes a beacon to other universities and colleges to turn around and say, hey, yep. they have a dream, we'll have our dream. So that's- By the, the way, I'm sorry for interrupting, it was Karen Boroff, I remember Professor Boroff, who actually invited us up to uh, West Point to do that seminar. Real quick, before you let Mike go, I'm curious about this. So Mike talks about the Bucino Leadership Institute being more applied, hands-on, teaching people who are real leaders. Mary, as we speak, we actually have a student from Seton Hall out of the Bucino Leadership Institute working with us on a book that you and I have been working on for the last <laughs> few months. And, and, that's, and we called and we said, we need one of your best, and we interviewed some students. So Mike, we're actually, that intern is working with us from the Institute, helping to put that book together. Mary, that's a great example of what Mike's talking about. It's a fantastic example. I couldn't imagine when I was in college and the age of our intern, um, and I'm sure she won't mind us saying her name, Ariana, thank you for all you're doing uh, with us. And she just is a rock star in the, um, just the level of uh, commitment to being responsive and follow up and follow through, and most importantly, being a great writer, which is so important and such a skill sure. that many young adults don't have today. So we're blessed to have her. Hey, Mike, real quick, on a scale from one to 10, your passion for leadership is? <laughs> it's off the scale. Be you know, it still, because, Mike, um, I'm obsessed with leadership and what I don't get right and what we can help and teach others. You are still in a healthy way obsessed with this, are you not? Absolutely, absolutely. As because? I words before, it's my life's purpose and meaning, you know, to serve people. And you know, we call it leadership, serving yeah. leadership, whatever. Hey, what does we tell people, Mary, when we listen to Mike Reuter? We tell people we coach them in a lot of areas. One area we can't keep, coach them to do is what? Oh, um, the care. Did I pass? I passed. <laughs> yeah, no, we. I always we, tell Mary, this guy doesn't care. This mm -hmm. woman doesn't care. You they cannot coach caring. Trait. Yeah, they, they're good presenters, they know how to delegate. They don't actually care about people. Mike, before I let you go, I believe you can't teach people to have genuine empathy, compassion, and caring for others. Either they have it or they don't, you say? That's an interesting one. Uh, I would say you can always help people find in themselves the greatness that's there. I remember Scott, uh, Scott Chesney, a dear friend of mine, oh. you know, Great friend of ours from Verona, wonderful three sport uh, athlete in high school, had a horrible accident, paralyzed. Um, after that, all he did was give back to others. Right, we were once Mike. talking and he said, you know, Mike, your, your greatest strength is your greatest weakness. I'm saying, what are you talking about? He said, Mike, your greatest strength is your passion and caring for others. And then he looked at me and he said, and your greatest weakness is your caring and passion for others. I said, Scott, where are we going with this? And he said, and do you know why it's your greatest weakness? And I looked and I said, no, I don't. He said, because when everybody else gives up on someone, you never do. You always find it and help them find it within themselves. Wow. So that's what it's about. It's about, Mary said, caring, deep caring for people, love for people. Well, Mike, you've been doing it for a lot of years, and um, I am honored to be uh, a mentee of yours for many years. Every Sunday morning to get 
three minute leadership is a blessing. And I want to make sure more people because of this show log on to that site and get that, um, that three minutes of a powerful message every Sunday morning. I want to thank the folks at the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall at the university itself. As I said, go Pirates. And Mike, all the best to you. Take care, my friend. All right. Thank you. Love you. T love you bunches. Take care. Have a good day. You got it. Day. Mike Reuter is just the best. And so is Mary. We'll be back after this. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Gibbons PC, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ On Air. C-I-A-N-J and Commerce Magazine. Valley's all about making life easier for clients. And that's why we're all about smiles, too. So every day, we make it possible for home buyers to become homeowners. For folks chasing their dreams to become entrepreneurs. For parents to plan today for their children's tomorrow. And for communities to get better every day. You see, when we know we've put a smile on a customer's face, well, that puts one on ours, too. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Mary, biggest takeaway for you from Mike Reuter. I, I want to know how to become him in terms of <laughs> his level of... <laughs> In terms of his level of passion and caring, and uh, you and I joke a lot about, I, I said, I care a lot about dogs, people not so much, and I, I'm learning to be more empathetic and compassionate toward others, and I'm going to take that away, and as I said, every Sunday, religiously, I read his uh, e-blast that comes out, it only takes a few minutes, and it helps me to become centered for the week. That's great, and by the way, Mary loves dogs, I'm not particularly loving dogs today. Um, <laughs> Tell them why, Mary, Steve. <laughs> I'm going to do it. See, this is the beauty of being on all the platforms we're on because we can say what we want. Um, Scarlett, our, our terrific camera operator, Scarlett looked at me right before we were ready to start this morning. He goes, hey, Steve, uh, we're in our home studio. Uh, we're moving to a new home, new studio in the next few months. Um, we have two dogs, Vinny and Petey. I'll be, I'll be brief. And Elvin turned to me and he said, hey, was there a dog in this studio? And I said, what? And he goes, well, take a look over here in the corner, right next to the camera. They left a present, Mary. <laughs> it was a gift. It, it lets them know how much they care about you. Not to mention, how did they get up there? They're so small and you're on the wow. third floor. I don't know. They were little magicians. So what did you say, Mary? We're into leadership training. What did you say about Vinny and Petey about training? Oh, I love them so much, but they, they need a lot more help. <laughs> yes, they do. By the way, we're going to show a picture of Vinny and Petey in post-production. Get that to... Sylvester will put it in. They're very cute, but they're so untrained. Yes, oh, and, and if we're putting in it. pictures of their dogs, uh, Sylvester, I'm gonna send you a picture of Harley to put up there as well. So why not, yes. right? By the way, Harley's very well trained. Hey, Mary, let's go right into Mike Herbeck, the Vice President of United uh, Airlines in the Newark Hub. We're partners with United Airlines. They, they underwrite some of our PBS programming. But talk about leadership in a pandemic, having to innovate, have a pivot. How to deal with uncertainty, United Airlines dealing with it every day, the airline industry devastated by COVID, if you will. So, Mary, we're, we're going to Mike Urbeck, right, from United? That is correct, yes. And we'll speak after that. Here's Mike. Um, talking leadership with uh, a gentleman who has to face it every day, and he is Mike Urbeck, Vice President at United Airlines, Newark Hub. Mike, let me ask you, uh, my colleague Mary Gamba and I, who is the executive producer who co-hosts the show, we're also either crazy enough, I'm not sure how you want to describe it, to be writing a new book on leadership and innovation in the age of COVID and beyond. Is there any limit to the degree of innovating, adapting that you and your colleagues have had to do since this pandemic hit? I think the most difficult thing that we've had to face as, as from a leadership perspective is, you know, my style is really about being available to, I have about 16,000 employees, by the way, here in, in the Newark area. So, 
it, it was really about being out there and, and, and you know walking the terminals and walking the ramp and really having that one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations and, and then doing town halls in person but the one thing the pandemic's really made us have to shift to is obviously this type of format where we're, we're talking sure streams and you know now we're doing you know town halls several times a week and we're facing you know 300 350 you know employees one-on-one uh, -on -one, allowing them to have you know q a uh, from their living room which is great and so it didn't matter what time of day that they can actually tune in and they get an update and i think it's been that has been one of the the things that we have seen carry us through and i would say they carry me through and i carry them through but we're allowed to be transparent we're allowed to be vulnerable to them we're allowed to tell them exactly what we think is going to happen in the future and then be able to also listen to their concerns and try to react to where we can uh, make adjustments in the business very fast. Um, and I think that's been the absolute key in, in being able to adapt. But, but Mike, I want to follow up on that. You said be vulnerable. And we've talked in this series, we've talked to a lot of leaders about being vulnerable, about how much you can express to your people. When you are really vulnerable and feeling, I use another word as a leader, I'm insecure and I get fearful. Where? What about the revenue? Is it going to be coming in? Will so-and-so even pay the sponsorship that they commit? Or what about if there's consolidation in industry? I mean, United's one of our underwriters of our public broadcasting programming. You're facing difficult times, which means on the other end, we can't be a guarantee of anything. It's a long-winded way of asking this. How much do you let your people know how scared you are? I, I mean, obviously, we don't want to create panic. Right. But a vulnerability, I think, is just making sure that we're, we're, we're available to them and talking with them at their level. And it really is about listening to their needs. What their needs are are job security. Right? And their fears, Mike. That's exactly it. We talk about uh, giving them program, you know, programs so that they can you know, either meditate or you know, you know, resources uh, to get you know, even therapy. Uh, but we, I really talk a lot about you know, just the family aspect of us all talking to each other. And, and I talk about it from you know, a personal sense of where I'm sitting. In it. And, I, and I get to share my stories about how I'm dealing with it. And I tell them right out that, you know, you're helping me get through it, and I'm helping you get through it. And, it. and it sets the tone that we're all in this together. No one's alone. And giving it to them on a frequent basis, I think, has really set, set their tone and set them at ease. You know, October 1st, we're having some just difficult decisions here. We have several hundred people uh, right here at the Newark Hub that are going to be affected by uh, uh, a furlough. Uh, because it just so we're taping this right before that. You, that decision has to be made. People's lives will be affected. Absolutely. And so we've been talking about it for months. I've been very clear and, and very transparent to, you know, where our flight schedules are and what the impacts could be. And, and as quickly as we can get information to those impacted and giving them actual dates that when that, when that information is going to get to them. And we follow through with those things and we take their inputs. But at the end of the day, they know where they stand and they know what's going on. They're not caught in the dark. And they know that, at, that what, we, what we see are triggers for actually to build back up. So as long as I can give them where the build back up is, and especially talking about our market, I think it really sets them at ease. We're not having people, you know, burning the furniture. They're, they're trying to do their best to deliver great customer service because they know that if we do that, we continue to build the trust of our, of our customer base, they will come back, they'll remember us through this. Last question. Have you become a better leader because of this pandemic? I think these times, I was here at 9-11 uh, at a different capacity and coming back through, I think, I'm absolutely 100% in the right place at the right time because I'm so compassionate and I, I do care so much about my employees. But I think I'm a better leader as a result of this because I've had to figure out ways to adapt and show compassion through a computer screen, which I've been usually able to hug people and be in rooms, and now I'm able to connect with them on a more frequent basis and be able to be like in their living room uh, and, and, and feel connected to them. It's, it's the most bizarre thing, but we're able to do that now. Mike Urbeck, who is uh, Vice President at United Airlines, Newark Hub. I want to thank you so much for talking so candidly and um, honestly about leadership and about life. Thank you, Mike. My pleasure. Have a good day. That was Mike Urbeck from uh, United Airlines, Vice President of the United Airlines, Newark Hub. Mary, could you imagine you have all these plans, you have a strategic two or three year plan in the, for the airline industry, COVID? Talk about innovation.
Uh, you took you took my line. I was going to say, talk right. about innovation. We talk about innovation and disruption all the time, and you cannot talk about an industry other than healthcare. Healthcare, I would say, it's probably healthcare, and then the airlines that just had to innovate and adapt. Uh, restaurants and, too. Don't forget. Oh, restaurants, restaurants right. too. Restaurants right. too. Yes, definitely. So, um, but just those industries that really had to turn on a dime, find new ways of doing things in order to just really stay in business and continue to survive through these challenging times. Yeah, real quick, um, Mary, on a, on a previous edition of Lessons in Leadership, by the way, Mary, if people want to find out and look at past Lessons in Leadership, how would they do that as they see um, the website up there? Definitely. There's a variety of ways. First, the easiest is to go to our website, stand-deliver.com. We have links to all the different places. But if you love podcasts, as we all do, you can go to Google Podcasts, you can go to Apple Podcasts, and you can go to Spotify uh, to listen on the, on the run. Uh, what about the could, digital platforms of all of our friends? Go ahead. Of course, definitely. So uh, CIANJ is uh, in Commerce Magazine. They're one of our promotional partners, NJ on Air, NJ.com. Uh, Best of NJ, uh, News 12 Plus, their website, Spotify, NJBIA, I mean, you name it, uh, you can find us almost everywhere at this point. Yeah. And uh, again, we'll thank our sponsors throughout the segment as well. Mary, I'm going to talk about um, a follow-up to something, a corollary caveat, whatever you want to say, we've got two minutes left. So we were talking about on a previous show, gratitude, that particularly during COVID, we need to show gratitude to our people. There's no way of showing enough gratitude and appreciation and respect for our frontline healthcare workers to people who deliver food to us from restaurants, for waiters, waitresses, for people who are on the front lines. And Mary talked about the importance of it on our end. But then I said, Mary, what about leaders who are the CEOs, the top people? Uh, there are times that I've said to Mary, I'll be very brief on this, I'm like, you know what? I don't feel enough of the, I'm not even love. Forget about love. I don't feel appreciated enough by team members, certain team members. And she goes, wait, what? You don't, you're not, that's not, you, that's not in the job description. You do what you're supposed to do. You get paid more than everyone else. The board respects you and likes you. That's why you get paid as well as you do. And, and your, 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 your gratitude is, your thanks is doing a good job. I want more and that's not good, is it, Mary? It's not. I, it, well, and we could want it, right? But we can't get consumed with it. We can't let it uh, force us to become resentful or uh, treat people differently because we don't feel that reciprocity of love and thanks. And so it, it, there's a fine line between wanting it and needing it because we're human beings. But as I often say to you, sure, I appreciate a, a thank you, I appreciate, but some of it is sometimes just needing a pass. If I do make a mistake or if I miss something, then instead of, you know, uh, hey, I can't believe you did that. Not that that's you, Steve, that's never you. And, but I do appreciate a pass uh, on the flip side, but it is true. I think all of us as human beings like to be thanked, like to be respected, but as the leader of an organization, because you're the one that needs to make tough decisions, sometimes that level of love that you feel back isn't always where you need it to be. And that's okay. And you know, what's interesting in the minute we have left, you know, we gave out certain economic bonuses and raises and things on our team in tough economic times. And Mary proposed it. And my first reaction was, ah, can we do that? And then we did it. And then everyone was great about thanking, being thankful. But I thought, you know what? Um, do they really understand how tough it is to do that in tough economic times? And Mary's been great about saying, look, it's not their job to know how tough it is. Yeah. It's your job. Yeah, and, uh, and I've compared them to children, right? Like with our children, all right? Our children don't need to know how the sausage is made. Of course, I want them to understand where the money comes from, but I don't want them to stay up at night worrying. I don't want them to wonder, you know, if, if we're going to have enough money to get them the new clothes that they want for school or something like that. So um, it is our job as the leaders of the organization to worry about those things, um, mm -hmm. but it's not the job of the team or our children. Mary, I want to thank you for the therapy session today on Lessons in Leadership. I yep. appreciate you talking me off the ledge. Hey, um, Elvin is saying in the chat room, say goodbye to Elvin, to Frank, um, to Scarlin, to Sylvester, to everyone behind the scenes. Much gratitude and thanks and to you for watching. We appreciate it. For Mary, I'm Steve. We'll see you next week on Lessons in Leadership. This edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, is brought to you by Gibbons PC, the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, New Jersey Sharing Network, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856.
This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ On Air, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine.